the same Toyota that we used to roll in. From pews to chops, no bears, we rollin' for dimes. Hey everybody, how we doing today? Apologies for the uh, delays. Um, you know, we uh, just are very passionate about getting things right uh, to the best of our abilities from what we have at hand. Um, for those of you that do not know me, my name is Abe Lim, and uh, I am Phil's Tag's partner uh, with TriPortal, um, and I will be your moderator today. Um, the point of this live panel and our goal is to further education, unveil the curtain, and really just provide anybody that is interested in the entertainment space, or essentially in the arts, which you will see in the panels coming up, roadmaps, journeys, through storytelling of each of our panelists. Uh, so we will get to know them today. So we're gonna start this panel now. To start, David, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, guys, uh, on your microphones, there's a button. Uh, it'll be on the check, left check. button. And just hit That's that the second and time it's green. green. Check one, two. There we go. There we All go. right. I would love to. I would love to share. Uh, how much would you want me to share around? Just an overview. You know what? I think with the theme of entertainment business movers and shakers mm -hmm. is who you are, describe yourself, because you know, in the entertainment business, there's a lot of abstract uh, identities and uh, career definitions, but in your case, you are very unique as well. Even you more have, abstract. <laughs> even more abstract, and you have definitely paved yeah. the way. Uh, so, to the uh, most natural ability yeah. to describe yourself, please do. Well, my name is David Garibaldi, and the best way I could describe what I do, you know, who I am, is I'm a performance painter. So the best way to find that is making the art process entertaining for a live audience. Sometimes that's in person, sometimes it's through, uh, through content, and uh, you know, essentially it's a collision of, of passions throughout my life. I've always been an artist. That is the foundation for it all. But also, my parents uh, got me into playing the trumpet growing up as well. And then eventually, dance, which was sort of unexpected because I didn't start dancing until my senior year of high school, which is late for most people. Uh, but at 20, uh, I didn't have a lot of options. I didn't graduate high school. And so I thought, how do I harness these natural passions and and experiences, and it just so happened there was this gentleman, Denny Dent, that invented performance painting, which I was like, didn't even know this existed. I saw it, there was no questioning, it was like, it was literally like a, a moment of inspiration, 2003, this is what I'm gonna do. And so I began this mission of, how do I make this entertaining? From one, the painting has to look great, but also, how does the music move me on stage? How does the audience connect with not only the image, the music, and also how I'm interacting? And that's been the challenge uh, on, the, on the art side. I think eventually and quickly I had to learn, I've gotta make this into a business because I had to survive. I, I had to eat and pay bills. And um, then it was another mission alongside building the art form was building a brand and building uh, a revenue stream and then multiple revenue streams from there. So um, I, would, I would wrap it up. Eddie's evolved so much over. I'm going on 20 years of doing this. Yeah. Next yeah. few months. And uh, I would just, I would generalize the, the mission and I, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart is how do I serve? That has been a mission for me along the way. How do I serve the audience I'm in front of? How do I serve this canvas that I'm creating? How do I serve the people that I'm partnering with? And that has driven the art and the business equally. So I'm sure I'll share more later, but that's the overview of this journey so far. No, thank you for sharing. Uh, and for this beautiful, vibrant lady to your left, 
who I call Roz, but Roz, can you share a little bit about yourself? Sure, I mean, it's an honor. What am I doing sitting on this panel? This is crazy, crazy. right? These are the movers and shakers. I'm just like, I'm here. I was, um, your work yesterday, I, I've never seen it live. It's amazing. Thank you, thank you. Um, I love what you said. I feel like you know a lot of people ask me what I do, and I think I like people not knowing what I do, if that makes sense because you get people to be completely real with you, right? You see who they are. So I call myself a public servant as well. You know, I, 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 I travel around the world uh, really helping people believe in themselves, over, uh, over, uh, come over their own anxieties to pursue their dreams. And that's my purpose and my mission in life. And how I do that as a, as a marketing strategist. And I help connect the dots to brands, to labels, to one another so that they can advance their career. So it took me 20 years to get my, to understand where my purpose and mission was, because at first I was like, I'm a B-girl, I'm gonna be a B-girl. I was every I was every element of hip hop. I'm a DJ, I'm a DJ, I'm an MC, I'm a battle rapper, right? But I was just a fan of hip hop. I was just a fan of black culture, because we didn't necessarily know what Filipino culture growing up was, right? We, I'm Filipino, by the way, so watching you on TV raps and watching MTV, all of these different things, I became a fan of hip hop, a fan of music. And then my way of contributing to the culture was being behind the scenes and, hip and helping things connect. In a literal sense, and we're talking about Sacramento, the hometown of Bibby and, um, who were we talking about yesterday? Bibby, Mitch Richmond, uh, <laughs> Chris Webber, oh what? I'm a basketball fan. Um, so for example, it's just like I helped the Sacramento Kings produce Filipino Heritage Night. You know, and Phil was a performer there. Pilo was a halftime performer. And a lot of it was because Pilo wanted to connect with his Filipino audience. So we found ways and opportunities to do that. Uh, back in the day, you know, there's a site called myspace.com. Your parents probably met on there, right? Um, but I, I helped launch that. I, I thought I was gonna be there for a year, but I wound up being there for 10 years. So I created MySpace Hip Hop. We launched the careers of Drake, Kendrick, et cetera, and I produced concerts across the world for that. But it wasn't until after I stepped out of that that I realized what moment in time that was and how special that was because now we have people that came from that. So long story short, that's what I do. I help connect the dots and number one reason why I'm here, and people, you know, only Phil knows this, is that I'm the number one fan of, of, of Phil Tyag. <laughs> he doesn't even remember at MySpace, I used to do his America's Best Dance Crew interviews. Um, but as soon as he told me what he was doing and what he was bringing together for his hometown, Phil doesn't have to do this. Phil is, Phil is at the Super Bowl, at the Grammys. Every time I see him, I'm like, what? I know him, right? But it was really important for him to give back to the city that he was from. So for me, being here and being able to see what this is, what's the next level of it, right? And so that's what I do. I see people's visions, I see people's missions, and the ones that I align with, that I'm a servant for the universe, that's how I, how I help execute. So, long story short, that's what, that's what I do. And by the way, guys, uh, I wanna thank you, Roz, for coming all the way from Las Vegas for us here in South Los Angeles, so Los actually. Angeles. Oh, you came in from LA. LA? By the way, guys, she is all over the place, so I can't really keep track. But let's give Roz a round of applause, everyone. <laughs> and we'll dig into her uh, amazing body of work. Um, gentleman to her left is a Sacramento native and is a hometown guy who is really forging a, a path for a lot of you know people that, hey, I'm not a singer or I'm not a dancer or I'm not an amazing painter, but what I can do is produce an amazing show. And uh, Chaz Boswell, ladies and gentlemen, Chaz, if you can share some more information about the show. Check, check, check. Check, 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 okay, cool. Uh, first and foremost, Abe and Phil, thanks for having me out. I appreciate it. I appreciate the love. I appreciate what you guys are doing here. Uh, as Abe stated so graciously, I'm not an artist. Uh, I actually suck at anything art related. I can't dance. <laughs> I can't sing. I can't rap. I can't draw. Like, I can't do none of this. <laughs> so, uh, interesting that I'm on this panel. Uh, I found my way a long time. Oh, wait, pause. I actually met you virtually through emails a long time ago. I'll get to the story later. But I've been an event planner for a long time. We used to be connected through 
I don't know, some wild promotional events. So it's just a pleasure to meet you um, in person. In person, IRL. Yeah. There's a lot of crazy stuff. So I grew up here in Sacramento. I actually went to high school in Florin. Um, when I was, uh, I graduated high school really, really early. I was 16 years old. I went to Sac State at 16. Started wilding out and started throwing a lot of house parties. Um, I don't know why, I just started throwing house parties. I like to bring people together. Um, I got kicked out of a couple of houses for throwing house parties. So I needed to do something different and moved to nightlife and started promoting um, nightclubs. I used to bring a lot of fraternities and sororities together at Sac State and at uh, a lot of other colleges called Unity and ended up forming a team with a couple other folks with a company called Mass Appeal and we ran a bunch of nightlife stuff for I don't know, like 10, 12 years here in Sacramento. Um, and then eventually just kind of got tired of being in nightlife. I knew that like the lifestyle that comes with nightlife wasn't really something that I was about. So I needed to figure out a different way to like get out my passion, which is bringing people together. So I started a couple of event companies. One was called Event Junkies, um, and then teamed up with some folks to start doing concerts. Um, my sister's a singer. I have a lot of friends who are singers and artists. Kind of found passion and wanted to help those folks find opportunities in different places and spaces. Sacramento is as much talent as we have here and has been born here, hasn't always been the best at fostering its own talent and providing opportunities and spaces for people to grow here and to find their place, not only here, but in the world. And so I wanted to be a part of that movement, um, connected with a couple other folks. We started throwing concerts, a lot of bad ones in the beginning, <laughs> lost a lot of money in the beginning. We all did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of crazy things. Um, and then, you know, just kind of started to find our stride and, and rhythm. Um, I'm a part of a team that does a couple of different things when it comes to events. So uh, we do concerts and concert touring. We have a company called ENT Legends. I'd say for the past 12 years, we've probably done 95% of the urban concerts in Sacramento. So some of your, if you listen to hip hop or R&B, a lot of that stuff has been events that we help produce, whether it's at Ace of Spades, the Memorial Auditorium, or Harlow's, or other places. Um, we also do branded and curated events, so I like to call myself a, an event curator, designer, and producer. Um, that is how I get my creativity out, is figuring out how to develop events I think people would be excited about, and then bring them together to enjoy um, what we've created. So um, we have that company, and then we also do music festivals. So we have two music festivals, one that's struggling, I ain't gonna lie, <laughs> trying to figure it out, it's called Lost in Rhythm, um, it's an Afro, uh, Afro Beats based festival um, that was developed here in Sacramento two years ago. Wizkid, Burna Boy, um, some of you know, your guys' favorite Afro Beats artists. Oh, yeah, it's Bradley. I'll, we'll talk about that. Come to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then we have another music festival that is a little bit more successful called Soul Bloom that's here in Sacramento. It's uh, wow. RB and a little bit of hip hop. That's not so. struggling. No, that was not. Well, it's not struggling, but no. the other one is. Um, so yeah, so last year, we, we've been doing Soul Bloom for a while. It's funny, a lot of people from Sacramento are like, damn, when did this happen? We've been doing Soul Bloom, started in 2018 to 2019, and then, like a lot of folks, COVID hit, and as an event producer, like, we were the first ones to go um, in regards to business and bringing people together in the physical form. Um, but COVID actually gave us a really good opportunity to kind of re-strategize, um, to kind of reinvigorate ourselves and take a break, which is sometimes very necessary. I think all of us know that like, once you start getting in the weeds and you're really moving, like you don't always have a lot of time to stop and reconfigure and kind of dial in with yourself and what you're trying to do. So through that, it gave us opportunity to do something different. We were able to bring Soul Bloom to Discovery Park. So we went from, in 2019, 6,500 people at Cesar Chavez Plaza in downtown to last year we did 24,000 people per day on the two-day festival at Discovery Park. So. Uh, really blessed to be a part of a team, and I don't do it by myself. Um, I have a whole team. I'm just a part of a team, but really blessed that I found the people that I work with and I call my tribe. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, and to be here with you guys all today. Amazing. Thank you for sharing, Chaz. Um, the gentleman to his left. Yes, yes. Mr. Chaz, some love. And I know what you guys are looking for. You're looking for tickets. I get it, I get it. Um, gentlemen to Chaz's left, my brother Phil Tyag, um, the mind and creative energy behind Tri Portal. Phil, we would love to hear your story. 
I appreciate you, baby. Who has also, by the way, been an entrepreneur his whole life. But I do, I do believe he had one job. It was probably at a shoe store. Oh, what? Me too. Really? So it wasn't, uh, is that how we're starting? <laughs> That's how we're starting. Yeah, mine was at the athlete's foot and it was Covina Mall. Let's go. All right, well, let's start there. So um, the job, the only job that I've had other than being a part of, you know, the entertainment industry or whatever you call this space that we live in, uh, I worked at this uh, boutique called The Spot off of Laguna Boulevard. And what's funny about this story is um, I don't even know if I had my license at the time. I definitely didn't have my own car. And uh, I remember David Garibaldi picking me up from this plate, the boutique. I don't know if you remember. Oh, yeah. What, what? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Please tell them what I was driving. So, so <laughs> DG had this just like Ford Focus, but it was like, it wasn't a Ford Focus. Like, he, <laughs> he put some, like, he was being artful with it, right? You kind of like, we'll call it creative. It, it was like lowered and it, the exhaust. I think I had NOS in it. <laughs> why? Like, why? Why? It's I was very you're creative. Artist. You're an artist. And uh, I had the privilege of, you know, being able to ride in this, like, Ford Focus slash... I apologize. <laughs> slash um, Back to the Future situation. It was like a time machine type of thing. It was all unnecessary. It just... You had, you had a wing. You had a wing on it, If right? I could put suicide Lamborghini doors, I would have. But I... I like, it, it was... It was it basically did have, it had Lamborghini door energy. Please say you guys have pictures of you in the car. It had, I'm still trying to find myself energy. That's what it had. <laughs> it, but like, how crazy is it that like, we're able to reflect on these things um, and just kind of moving um, with purpose. We didn't necessarily have like, these laid out goals, I guess you can say, and all the executables behind it. But it sounds like we were all just kind of like one foot in front of the other. That's what it sounds like to me. But I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, so Abe, starting with the, it wasn't necessarily a shoe store. It was, it was a hip hop boutique, <laughs> even before they were calling it streetwear. Okay. And it was, you remember this spot. So they were like, they had uh -huh. I mean, that, but it was like a Nietzsche. Triple Five Soul? Definitely Triple Five Soul. Okay. I was a big fan of Triple Five Soul. Uh, but yeah, the Rock Awares, and then, you know, everyone started developing their own brands. You know, Nelly came out with, with yeah. his hit, with. Um, Apple Bottom? No, 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 that's. Vocal. Yeah. Vocal. Vocal, and then there was like. Fat Farm. Fat Farm, Baby Fat, you know, all that stuff. So. <laughs> Academics, Academics, who said that? Of course, my brother did. Of course, that was my brother. We were sharing clothes. Uh, we, uh, so yeah, we were, we were, I was a part of that, that time, right? And this is like pre, like when they were really calling it streetwear. And cool story about that is um, when I was, when I was in the, the, the spot, that was like my first time that I was actually kind of able to be around like celebrities because people from out of town would stop by. Um, there was, I, I can't even, um, what? Alex Thomas, yeah. the comedian. comedian. Yeah. yeah, so Alex Thomas, he had popped by and we ended up chopping it up. And I don't know, and this is probably like, there are a lot of kids out there too where you just, you just want to have conversation with people and you're just kind of open. So I was just talking to him and we're sitting on the couch, we had a couch in the boutique, and he was just really like, we were, we really had some energy going to where he was like looking at, I don't know if it was his, his assistant or what, but he was like, nah bro, you could push the flight back, like I'm chilling. Like he pushed his flight back to chop it up with me at the time, and I'm probably 19. I'm probably 19. And I'm like, wow, like he, this guy's, pushing his flight back to talk to me. He's, he's on TV with like Jamie Foxx and you know, we know him from TV. Cat from LA, Hollywood. 
And um, he just took time to chop it up with me. And this, this was me just kind of being me. And, um, you know, my family knows, especially Heidi. Heidi's like, Phil, do you, do you want a podcast? Because you like to talk a lot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, so that was like pretty much my experience there. And then also, while I'm at it, working at the spot, Mac Dre. Mac Dre came through. Mac Dre came through and uh, he dropped it. He dropped a good band, right? So he, he, he dropped a cool stack. And that was the first time I'd seen somebody like spend that much money, you know, in person. And uh, there were already some people that were working there before me. You know, it was like a commission based kind of situation. Me being who I am, I'm just like, you know, people are already approaching him. So I'm just more so kind of observing and I'm kind of kind of tripping like, you know, this is pre-social media. So I wasn't like fully like, is that him or, you know, and I did I, me being me again, like I didn't even want to get too close. Like I'm just letting people do their thing. But um, Mac Dre was in there. So he was kind of like one of the earliest celebrities that I saw in my life when he was living in SAC. Um, and, you know, for, for the ones that's that's from SAC, you know, Mac Dre, towards the end of uh, his his life, uh, he was living in Sac, and uh, you know, really built with people in Sacramento, uh, like something terrible, which we were just talking about backstage. But um, that was my experience with the boutique thing. Uh, but prior to that, I think, and mind you guys, I've known Abe um, since I was in first grade. I don't know if y'all know that. Yeah, so I've, I've known him since first grade, and we're pretty much the same. We pretty much grew the same, like in the same kind of proportion. Like we were scaled, like just like we just kind of time times 0.5. We never shared clothes; it never fit. Yeah, we never did. Um, and so it, it, it's cool to know, like that even he, and I, I forgot who told me this. Actually, it was a, it was a good friend. Um, his name is Nick. He was he was telling me what anyone could really like all a human could ever ask for is a witness um, in your life. Somebody to witness what it is that you're doing in life or someone to be a even a, a, a container that you can just pour your experiences into. Is that, am I kind of making sense? And um, it, it's, it's really a blessing to know that um, we've, we've done that for each other um, and, you know, through the ups and downs. And, and we kind of already started talking about that as well. Like, we're up here and, and the lights are on and, you know, we've got like cool microphones and stuff. Um, but it sounds also what I'm feeling is like, we got, we got some battle scars on us, don't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> my, my knee doesn't work anymore. <laughs> you know, it, you know, we've taken, we, we took some losses, yeah, you know, um, and there are still maybe not necessarily as cliche, but they're not necessarily L's. Like we just, we've learned a lot, and you kind of wonder sometimes, like, haven't I learned enough lessons? <laughs> enough <laughs> learning. Okay, enough learning. I'm good on learning. <laughs> right. But, you know, we keep learning, and that, that's ultimately, um, and I commend Chaz, Roz, DG, A, like, I mean, we're sitting, but we're still standing. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I appreciate um, y'all for pulling up. Um, and just to wrap up my little bit, um, the spot, that was my thing, but Abe saw me dancing since like first grade. He saw me just, I just, I don't know, that's just how I was programmed. So I'm at school, but I'm literally like, I want a head spin right now. <laughs> and, I, and we have footage of that, like in elementary school, yeah, like where if we're acting like we're news reporters and stuff like that, and we would do a commercial break. Let's play it. <laughs> Can we cue them? That would be so cool. We'll get that ready, because I, I, I have it on VHS, which is crazy, because we don't have footage like that that young. But but we have the VHS somewhere. I know my brother knows where it is. I, I want to add something real quick yeah, to that please. time in your life. Uh, 
when I got into dance, before we met, I would be watching VHS videos yeah, of Phil and these other dance groups from uh, Kaboom to, you know, the Mind Tricks yeah. and like this new style of dance. I was like, what is this? And the, the, we, you stood out because you were the youngest this kid that was just this prodigy. And it, it literally started inspiring me at that time just to think different. Mm. Just like, you don't have to move like everyone else. So I, the VHS, you know, tapes, I mean, were notorious. It was, it was amazing. And I, and I appreciate that, because you're like, you know, when you, you're the youngest. I thought you were. Youngest. Okay. And, but I'm still older, but I was like, older. Um, you're still younger than me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a blessing because we have some of these gems and we didn't have phones back in the day, you, you know what I'm saying? So the fact that we have like these VHS tapes, the, what is it, the DV8 or what is it, High 8 and all those. Mini DV. Mini DV, yeah, mini that's DVs. what it is, mini DV. I was like getting you them all You gotta put it in up. another VHS to right. watch it. <laughs> um, you know, we have these, we just gotta, Anyway, yeah, it's a blessing that you have those, that we have those, they were circulating, right? Like all these events, people would be just dubbing and dubbing and dubbing, like to where it's like, you're getting like the fourth generation of whatever mind tricks or kaboom show that was circulating at whatever event that we did. Um, growing up, obviously like one of the main platforms that we had were, they were like, Cotillion's debuts, like 18th birthday party type of situations. Um, Filipino National Day, PND, uh, those types of events. Then car shows. And with the car shows, they got the cars out, but then they had a stage, and then so there would be like dance competitions. And um, so those were our platforms back then. But we were kind of like the side, like the side event. Right? So it wasn't like the main, main, but there were, you've see, probably seen that footage like of like the world wars. There were some really, really crazy events like on some really underground stuff out there where you would see um, just like these underground battles, but they're like legends. And so uh, I, I see that there are people that are older than me, but yeah, me being a part of that scene, um, you know, whatever that you call it, break, break in, break dancing, b-boying. Um, we were doing that, it was mixed style, doing all that stuff, and uh, I've just been, I stayed at it. And then on an entrepreneurial side, what did you do? I didn't give up. <laughs> I didn't give up, so. Walk us through that roadmap. For sure. Um, so obviously dancing and, and being a performer, that part developed, right? Just having this passion to perform and to create something. My older cousin, Keith, which I know a lot of you guys know, um, he was like my big bro since, ever since. And uh, we formed a group together. There were soldiers, then that turned into Kaboom, then it formed into the, uh, and it ended up morphing into the, we ended up going to the mind tricks thing, to the Java thing, and it just kind of kept building. And um, with the dance part, I just realized that we had to figure out how to get permits. We had to figure out how to, you know, file our taxes. You had to figure out how to talk to the city. You have to figure out how to, you know, get certain licenses. or How to make money. How to make money because um, I, we had a kid at a really young age. So at the time that I knew DG, uh, I realized that I was gonna be a father at 17 years old. And um, so I knew then it's like, okay, I love to dance. I'm gonna keep dancing, but now I gotta really figure it out because the spot was not <laughs> taking care of the bills. You get what I'm saying? And, um, and so it's been crazy, you know, just trying to figure it out, um, how to make money off of what I love to do. 
So with all the licensing, doing all of these things, and we're selling t-shirts, and then uh, I formed a company group called Boogie Monsters, which David Garibaldi was a part of the first wave of Boogie Monsters. So that thing kicked off in 2003, but we were already kicking it prior to that. And um, fast forward a couple of years later, um, with all the licensing and the permits or whatever it is that we had to do paperwork wise, logistically, I did a show called Boogie Nights. What? Boogie Nights was the, the first production show that I like produced and directed and, and wrote. And it was like a variety, there was like a, it was like a variety type of situation, but um, there was a, there was a storyline we had the Boogie Monsters, stars, but then it was, and it was a love story, but then it was very modern. And we even had a David, you actually painted a Mac Dre. You had a Mac Dre painting. Yeah, I don't remember what I painted, but I definitely painted at that. We did, we did a Mac Dre one because in one of the scenes, we did uh, Get Stupid. Um, and Victoria Monet, or we know as Victoria McCants. She was also, you know, a part of Boogie Monsters, David Garibaldi, um, Jay Boog. There's a lot of people from this camp. And I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like we were like the like Mickey Mouse Club. It kind of feels like that, like, like everyone. Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears. <laughs> not, yeah. as, not as cute, uh, not as cute. Yeah. We were like, you Christine were, Aguilar. I wasn't as cute. <laughs> we were like Mickey Mouse Club, like just developing talent, right? Like. Um, and, and DG, like, was was that your first show, or did you do one prior? It, it was it was near the beginning. It was my first one because the first one was at one of your venues, <laughs> Avalon, uh, early on. But uh, at some point, I would love to come back to a point that you just made about fostering an environment for creatives to perform at a high level, mm -hmm. to know what that feels like, to prepare for it, to execute it, and to be around it. That the reason why it was a Mickey Mouse Club, because imagine if you were to compare those young stars, those kids working at a with one of the biggest brands in the world, and they were put under pressure, and you see who's ready for it, and some are truly made for it. And so with Boogie Monsters, even though I wasn't even uh, dancing at that, I was performing my paintings like I was performing at that high level with you guys. I envisioned it like that. And that's because of the environment that was created, standard set, uh, accountability. I mean, everything that fosters greatness was in that culture. That's why, I, I believe that's why it, it, we all went off to find and create success from there. I think that's very interesting where a lot of what we're talking about is the moment where it all made sense that your creative abilities is what really just opened up the journey of opportunity. I guess for the uh, purpose of the entertainment industry, industry is the key operative word here, that what was, when was that moment for all of you where you got that first check and it hits your bank account and you're like, oh shit, I think I could do this. So Phil, it was obviously not the spot. And I was actually curious, how long did you last there? I probably, they, like I was a part, like. Number. I probably should have to work like a total of like 10 times. But through over a span of like. Guys, this is our relationship, six months, just say the like, number. It was like I went in whatever I wanted type of situation and I didn't go in much. It, was, it wasn't that did much. Did you work there? Or you just show up? I think he just showed up. I, I think I was just trying to meet celebrities out there. I, 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 think, I think this You're question. standing outside. Let's, let's move this question to Ross. Ross. <laughs> the, <laughs> the first check that really, okay. really just meant something. Uh, and it was your confirmation. One day it'll all make sense, right? C-E-N-T-S. Not just the sense, like, in that sense. Uh, there, was, I, there was three times, because I had multiple uh, revenues of income when I was young, right? So when I got my first check as a DJ, as a DJ at a dance, I was like, what? You could get paid to play music, number one. Number two, when we used to throw clubs, and um, 
we try to charge people, but we always felt bad because it was our friends, like me and DJ Vice, right? Big DJ right now. We, we wanted to charge $10 for everybody to got in, but then everyone would call us to the front, like, no, I'm Roz's friend, so I'm like, damn it. So we would make money off the bar, 10% of the bar. You get 100 people there spending $10, that's $1,000. We walk away with 20%, $100 you, $100 me. What? Second form of, of revenue, right? And then it was just, that was it. It was like, because you go home and you tell your parents, you're like, I wanna dance, I wanna DJ, and they're like, they don't know anybody that does that or income. So the first thing is they tell you is no. <laughs> no, until you come home. And I had internships, right? Like, I work at Radio Disney. Nice, how much do you get paid? Oh man, okay, gotta go back. She's like, you're working for free for 12 hours? For what, right? But when you go home and you got that check, that's the validation moment. I could buy my own food today. So that was the moment. Even though it was a really small moment, I got paid to DJ. I got paid to bring people together in a room to drink and to dance. Okay, I just gotta think, how do I do this on a larger scale? But you're wrong, mom. I could make money off of this. And that was the day where you were like, I'm gonna do this for the next 20 years. I'm gonna do this for the next, God, I'm 42 years old. Wait, well, you don't have to go there. <laughs> no, but that, that, that was really, I think that's it, right? The defining moment where you get paid to do something you love that's creative. You're not working at Bank of America that you hate. You're not working at the, the spot that you kind of like. Or me, it was the athletes, but I kind of liked it because the far side would come in. And I was playing you OMT raps, but oh, the far side is here. Because his girlfriend lived in Muscovina. I'm like, what? Okay, I know every far side's up, right? But that moment where you're like, okay. And I, this is why I love Phil's event because there's people that are nine years old. And I told you about this, your kids. If we could teach them at five, they're gonna expedite the process and do it a lot better, make a lot more money. Yeah, my, um, I have a six-year-old and um, he already has like two LLCs. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. <laughs> <laughs> He's so Under his name. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So Chaz, when, when was that moment for you? All right, I, got, I got a couple of moments. So one was pre-check, I threw a house party, I was just turned 18, and me and my cousin and one of my friends do a house party. And uh, First time we ever do a house party, it's for my birthday, we made these little cards, and it just had an address on them, nothing else, wow. right? And we're like, all right, this is what we're gonna do, we're gonna go around town, we're gonna meet people, we're just gonna give them, it had a, sorry, I had an address and I had a date and a time. So I got, right, we're gonna do this. So we went out for like a week, went to the mall, Arden, when it was actually popping. <laughs> I was there yesterday, BJ's. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to BJ's. Yeah, downtown mall. It was still popping Saturday. Um, so we do this house party. Ended up being like 700 people, right? Yeah. Coming into a house in Rosemont that we rented, which is why we got kicked out. Charge? No, we didn't charge, right? But this was the first moment because what happened was the cops came. Someone called the cops. Obviously, there's a lot of people in the neighborhood. Cops came to the door. The first thing they said was, you know, whose house is this? I was like, it's mine. I said, okay, congratulations. This is the biggest house party we've ever broken up. <laughs> now, now get everybody the F out of here. <laughs> Right? So that was the first realization of like, oh wow, like impact wise, there was no money there, but just understanding like what our capabilities were, right? Like, oh, we could bring a lot of people together. And then a year later, when I started doing the massful stuff with my team, we threw a party at what used to be called Empire. It is now called Ace of Spades. You guys ever been to that venue? It used to be like a, a club. We threw a party there. It was like 13 organizations that we've gotten to this party. And after the night, we went back to my house my house was always after party spot, and we had all this cash, and we threw this cash, and it was like $17,000, and we're 18 years old, and it was four of us. And we threw all this cash on the bed, we didn't even count it, we already knew what it was, we left it on the bed, we locked the door, and we went to go party. And the next morning I woke up, everybody went home, and all this money was on my bed. And I was like, holy shit. Sorry, excuse my language. And I called my mom, and I was like, mom, I just made $17,000. And of course, my first mom was like, what? What did you do? You know what I mean? She just went crazy. She's like, what did you do? How did you make $17,000? I'm like, we do a party. A legit, legitimate, legal, no, not in the house, not at a venue. <laughs> we brought all these people together. There's 1,500 people there, and we made $17,000. Yeah. And I think that was the moment, which is, in hindsight, not a crazy amount of money, but for some 18-year-olds, you know what I mean? It was, it was a lot of money. And from there, I just knew, like, this is, this is what I wanted to do. That's amazing. Yeah. Way to make $100 look really small right oh, I'm there. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. What about you, David? 
Uh, I'll share two moments uh, that I realized that I could sustain creating uh, and making money. The first one was, uh, they don't really do them as much anymore, but in Sacramento we would do these second Saturdays and artists would partner with different businesses. So one of them, I partnered with a uh, this place called Body Tribe. It was literally like a gym in downtown. And so I, I went to them and said, hey, can I, sh can I show my work? I was like, Saturday, she said, sure. So I filled it up with whatever art I had. It was just like literally face-to-face -face hustle, like the or cold calling, like this was, there was no social media. So I filled up the place with my art and it was just on like the walk where everyone would go and check out stuff and people came in. I was doing a small live painting and I sold out of all of my work. Now my work was selling for maybe couple hundred dollars each ish maybe the most was like five hundred dollars each which is at the time like it it meant so much to sell that much work at once so there was that i was like all right i'm gonna keep doing this you're how old at the time 20 years old oh okay. and then the second time was a friend of mine told me that there's this new venue opening up called empire you just mentioned it uh and he said go see my friend bob he's one of the investors I set it up, just go tell him what you do and ask him if he'll book you to perform every Friday night. And I was like, yeah, seems, seems like a good idea. So I go down there, Bob didn't know who I was, I approached him, introduced myself, and I said, I wanna perform at your brand new club that hasn't opened up yet every Friday night. And he's like, cool. And I, and I said, so how much do you have in mind? He's like, you want me to pay you? <laughs> I was like, yeah. Yeah, sure. He's like, well, how much do you want? You want me to pay you? So I just threw a number out there and said, well, how's $500 every Friday? And I'll, I'll bring a contract back tomorrow. He had no idea who I was. He, he, sh he should not have agreed to that because he didn't even know how I could perform. But he agreed. I wrote up some janky contract. And uh, I, he, I brought it back. He signed it. And then it was, I think he paid me like, half up front for the amount of uh, like a six months deal, six month deal, paid me half up front and I had that check and I was like, all right, this is enough money to pay bills and sustain this and it's also enough time to learn how to perform. Mm -hmm. And so sustaining that over time and over that six months, honestly, it changed my life. It built my name locally, uh, I started doing corporate shows locally because of that and just building my name. So yeah, thanks to uh, Bob Simpson at Empire Nightclub. Wow. That's Hope amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Phil, with Mosman, first check. I mean, it's always gonna be about dance, but tell us the story of that first check where you're like, this is it. Yeah, so, um, at, you know, going from the Kaboom era and then that kind of so I think the end of the Kaboom era was uh, 2000 to 2001. And then when it, we went into the Mind Tricks era uh, with the other guys, you know, 3M. And uh, the other two guys ended up moving to San Diego. And I stayed back in Sacramento because we just were pregnant and we just had our first child who performed last night, which is crazy. It was a lot. It's, this is 20 years ago, so 20 years old, so it's 20 years ago when this happened. So I'm in SAC. People are moving away out of SAC, doing the dance, you know, trying to do the dance thing and get jobs and, uh, you know, work at, you know, if it's like the Apple or, you know, like those sort of jobs. I stayed back in Sacramento and had to figure it out, but I realized that I didn't want to do, I didn't want to work at the spot. Um, and so with Boogie Mod Stars, um, I started charging tuition. So I kind of created, I guess, this kind of buzz or this demand that people didn't know, like people didn't know that they wanted it. And you know, DG and I were talking about this. Um, I just started inviting a lot of people within the different high schools, uh, you know, Sheldon, Valley, Florin High, um, and a lot of people within that area to come to this dance studio. Um, and mind you, I, did, I didn't grow up in a dance studio. By the time I was in a dance studio, uh, I was already teaching. 
we were already rehearsing as a crew. Like I didn't train under anyone. I didn't get that sort of professional training like in a dance studio. Um, and uh, yeah, so I started charging tuition. And at that point, that's when I realized like, okay, I'm charging tuition. And mind you, these are like peers. Some people are even older than me. This is me just kind of uh, understanding my value um, and that I'm bringing some, something to these people. And, um, and maybe at the time, some, I don't wanna say a lot, but maybe some that were kind of in and out of this, even during this Boogie Moss Stars era, when I'm teaching at the dance studios, they didn't even quite maybe realize the talent that I, that I have or had, um, which is fine. You know, we, we, we might not be able to see that within each other. So, but just developing Boogie Monsters for the ones that did believe and were just pouring into each other. And so now, like, we're kind of really brewing this sort of energy, but mind you, there is like a tuition sort of thing. So we're making money, but we're also building, and then we create our first production show, and then I realize, like, okay, I'm learning how to scale things from the merch to whatever. Now we're building what now we know is uh, we're building scripts, we're building IP. Now we're talking about logos, we're filing, we're doing that. We're learning about, I'm learning about all that stuff. And shout out to G, G1, you know, rest in peace. Um, he's definitely the one that put me up on um, just really being, uh, uh, what do you call it, like a sole proprietor, right? Like I was just like independent. I was on some independent stuff from G putting me up on game. After the spot, that job, I didn't really um, uh, have any regular jobs and I've just been building off a of dance and I've learned to scale, which turned into the Javit thing and obviously to where that thing is like people are performing and I'm not even on stage at that point. And so it, it built from that all the way to, you know, these, this show running where you don't even have to set foot on the stage. So it's crazy and it's a blessing, yeah. Um, oh yeah, I have so many more questions to ask you guys, but with time, and uh, we, we have to move on to the next panel. Um, I'm gonna ask one last question, and try to keep this answer very quick uh, before I uh, ask the studio audience if it's anybody here. Would anybody actually like to ask a question? Okay, cool, I'll come back to you after I ask this one. Um, you know, um, what advice would you give your 25 year old self. This is a stage where it's pivotal, where you're not, a, you're not really a kid, you're not a teenager, you're out of college, you're post-college, the, the, the insurance, you can't be around your parents no more. <laughs> what advice would you give that 25 year old David, Roz, Chaz, Phil? And we'll start with uh, Chaz. Um, I would say, Take yourself serious. I think that's a, 25 is that time where you have enough experience to know what you're capable of. Um, and I think it's a pivotal point to like, take yourself serious and make, you know, make serious moves with belief in yourself. Um, because if you don't, no one else is gonna take you serious. And I think it's, you're gonna struggle if you don't take yourself serious and no one else takes yourself serious, you know? And I think it's, it's a mentality thing at 25 to just get to that place where you, you know, it's fun and games, especially I think males, I think we have a harder time sometimes being serious about things, especially ourselves, you know what I mean? Like we can make money, we can do certain things, but to have that understanding of like who you are, what you're capable of, and actually like take yourself seriously, which means the actions that you display, the people you hang around, like all that kind of stuff is part of that, you know, taking yourself seriously. I think it's a really important lesson that separates a lot of folks who get on a trajectory at a certain age and those who maybe delay where they're going for a longer time. That's a great answer. How about you, Ross? Oh. I had to take myself seriously. I learned that at 42. Thank you. Um, no, at, at, at 25 years old, a young Roz, still the same height like Phil, um, 4'11 on a good day. Uh, 
at 25, I, they asked me, or it was 24 and a half, uh, these three guys to help launch a site called myspace.com, right? So I didn't think that I, w I had imposter syndrome. Like, you guys just know me because I produce a lot of concerts in LA and the concerts are kind of getting big, right? But here's the advice. Martin Luther King has, you know, I saw this quote, you don't have to see the entire staircase to take the first step, right? I'll say it again. You don't have to see the entire staircase to take the first step. Even the first step is not even a step. So the first step was calling everybody and call it like, okay, if I was trying to get everybody, I thought with the promoter mindset, I'm trying to bring everybody to this online site. Remind you, this is before Instagram, Twitter, YouTube.